so good. You've been so wonderful, and we're so thankful to be able to come into your house to worship you, to honor you, to glorify you, Father, to receive your word, to grow closer to you in our relationship with you, Father. You are our priority and our, the most important part of our life, and we are so thankful, Father, that we can gather together here as a family and hear your word. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Are you thankful tonight? Are you grateful tonight? Well, hallelujah. You can go ahead and be seated. We just want to take up our offering. If you need an offering envelope, you can go ahead and raise your hand. The ushers are there to serve you. You can also give by text to give. You can bring it to the church. You can mail it in. There's a lot of ways to give. Praise God. Hallelujah. Don't want to take up too much time. We want to get our man of God up here so we can receive the word tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise you and glorify you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, if you're ready tonight, let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be able to sow into your kingdom, to be able to sow into your vision and into your plan. We thank you, Father, for the wondrous things that you have in our future, the things that you have planned for this church, Father, for the people in this city. And we are so grateful, Father, that we get to sow towards that that we get to give towards that, return our tithes and give our offerings to you, Father, for your plan to come to pass in Jesus' mighty name. We're so thankful. We're so grateful for it. Let's say our confession. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Divine increase is moving upon this church family. It's moving upon me. It's moving upon my family. And we shall flow in the fullness of what that increase holds financial increase, numerical increase, the increase of anointing, the increase of healing, the increase of miracles, the increase of the gifts of the Spirit. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. It's all coming to pass. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah.
to worship you. I live to worship you. I live, I live to worship you with all that I am, Lord. To worship you, I live to worship you. I live, I live to worship you with all of my heart, with all that I am, I live to worship you. I live to worship you. I live, I live to worship you. Oh, I love you, Jesus, so I will worship to worship you. I live to worship you. I live, I live to worship you. I live to worship you. Yes, to worship you. I live to worship you. I live, I live to worship you. Every day I will worship. I will praise you to worship you. I live, yes, I do. To worship you. I live, I live to worship you. I live to worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we bless you tonight. Father, we do. We do live to worship you. And Lord, may our life be a life of worship, be a life of praise and worship to you, and the way we live our life every day on this planet, Father, may it be a life of worship, that our life is an example of your worship, submission to you, love to you, and Father, we bless you, give you all the praise and all the glory, and everybody said, amen, what a beautiful song. I live to worship Him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let me all say that's my prayer. That's my heart. I live to worship Him. Praise the Lord. Well, turn around and give somebody a great big God bless you tonight. Thank you, team. It was great. Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to be here on this Sunday night. Amen. Amen. And we're uh, going to jump right into this. So we were talking about this morning. How many of y'all got some help this morning? Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 24, we're going to go over there. This has kind of been our launching pad, so to speak. Matthew chapter 24. Father, we're grateful tonight to be able to come together in the name of Jesus to hear the word. We thank you, Lord, in these days that we live that you're preparing us, you're helping us, you're instructing us, you're giving us instruction. And Lord, we endeavor to be led by the Holy Ghost. And so we thank you, Lord, that the instructions we get from your word, that we'll be prompt doers and we'll do your word, and we give you all the praise and glory. And Father, I pray tonight uh, for revelation to be revealed to all of us tonight, Father, that we truly see where we are in your timetable and really begin to live our life uh, that would reflect the time that we're living in. And so we thank you and honor you. We honor you as we approach your word. We're grateful to be able to hear your word. And we honor you tonight in this place. And everybody said amen. Amen. We're going to continue tonight from where we left off this morning talking about the signs Jesus pointed to before the rapture of the church. And like I said this morning, when God gives prophecies or signs, uh, how many of y'all know it's for comforting uh, the believers? It brings comfort to us, but it also is a warning to the unbeliever. And so when we go through all these signs and we see all these things happening, you know, in the earth today, it shouldn't produce fear in us or worry or anxiety. It should cause us to be excited and comfort us knowing that we're, we're, the rapture of the church is imminent. It is about ready to happen at any moment. Amen. I don't know when it's going to happen. I just know it's going to happen soon. Based on all the signs and based on what he's telling us, amen, we know that it's upon us. And I think the most important thing that you and I need to get a hold of is that we live that way. 
that our life should reflect what we think is getting ready to happen. You know, if I really believe that Jesus is ready, is, is going to come, then my life, the way I make decisions, the way I live my life, the decisions that I make, how I live should reflect that. Like I said this morning, how you respond to prophecy is how you respond. If you really believe it's something that Jesus is endeavoring to get over to you right now, he's endeavoring to get something over to us that we need to prepare, that we need to be ready. Yes, Amen. Amen. And you may say, well, I'm ready to go, Pastor. Well, praise the Lord. How many of y'all know your neighbor who probably isn't? Yeah. How many of y'all know someone in your family may not be? So you may be ready to go, and that's wonderful. But how many of y'all know there's a whole lot more that we can pray about and pray for people and help other people come to Christ before this great event takes place and so all these different signs that we're talking about these are signs that are happening right now that point to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ amen so they should bring excitement to us now the first 10 we've already talked about I'm going to go through them real quickly and then we'll get into the last part Matthew chapter 24 and we're going to see what Jesus says here in verse 3 and it says and he sat upon the Mount of Olives the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? How many of y'all are grateful that he gave us signs? Amen. How many of y'all are thankful for signs? Amen. He said, uh, uh, And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world or the end of the age? When will the end of this age take place? What will be your signs? What will be happening so that we can know that, hey, we're in the last of the last days? Yeah. In verse 4, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, or this is anointed, and that's anointed, and shall, be, and shall deceive many. So we know the first warning that Jesus warns us is deception, that deception is going to be all over the world, and deception is all over the world. We can see this coming to pass right now. Amen. And then the second sign was in verse number six. He said, wars and rumors of wars, which we talked about uh, this morning, the, all the wars that are going on in the world today. Number three, a nation shall rise against nation. That's in verse number seven. And then uh, it talks about uh, famine. And we talked a little bit about that this morning, that the famine that's just blanketing the earth right now. You're not hearing a lot about it, but you're going to hear more about it. And, and even today I was sent an article, I was sent an article today by somebody that said uh, that 75% of the U.S. winter, winter wheat suffers drought. 75, now this is U.S. We're, talking to my ta we're not talking about China. We're not talking about another country. 75% of the U.S. winter wheat that's being stored is destroyed or they wanted to have is in a drought. It says they don't even want to prepare the ground because everything is just evaporating. And wheat is in everything. If you ever turn over an ingredient, it, wheat's a filler in a lot of things. And so they use wheat to uh, extend the life of stuff, you know, spread it out. So they, they, wheat's in everything. And so we see famine we may not be that we're starving, but there's going to be a food shortage even in the United States. We'll still have food to eat, but it'll be a lot less than what people think. And in other parts of the world, it's going to be worse because we are a great export. And if 75% of our wheat is experiencing a drought, how much you think we're going to export to other countries? And other countries are going to be hurting too because we are a great exporter of food in the United States. So they were starting to see some of these things. That was number four, famine. Famine is in the, in, the, in the land. Number five was pestilences. And all this is out of verse number uh, seven. And this is talking about the viruses, the plague, COVID, and all these different things that, uh, that are coming on us as far as plagues. And there's going to be more. You haven't seen the last of COVID. There'll be something else that's going to come up because he said pestilences, which is plural, which means there's going to be more than just one. It's going to continue all the way to, the, to when Jesus comes back. Number six was earthquakes. And, of course, we said this this morning that there's an earthquake every 30 seconds in the world, somewhere in the world. Number seven, verse nine, was persecution. That, uh, you, you know, you and I, when we begin to stand uh, on our biblical beliefs at our schools and our jobs and different places, 
there's great persecution uh, sometimes that we, uh, that we face from our employers. And, and sometimes people even lose their job because they find out that they're Christians or they read their Bible or something to that. So we're seeing persecution, maybe not to the degree that you see it in another nation, but we are experiencing it here. And if I would have to say if a show of hands to anybody that you've been persecuted, uh, lift your hand in some way. See, and just look around you. See, it's, it's happening all over the world. And then in verse number 11 was number 8, was false prophets and false teachers that are blanketing our airways today. Uh, we're seeing that, uh, of course. Number 9 was iniquity shall abound. This is a revolt against God, his commandments and his teaching. We're seeing that even more in the family. We're seeing children rebelling against their parents, yeah. rebelling against authority, and the main cause of that is the parent, because yeah. the parent didn't pray, raise them according to the Word of God, right. and you got children that are out of control. All this is happening in our world today. Yes, then number 10 we talked about was the parable of the fig tree, which is, of course, Israel becoming a nation in 1948, which is, to me, the most significant sign of our age was when they became a nation in 1948 because that had never happened uh, in the history of the world. Number 11, let's go to Luke chapter 17. Number 11, Luke chapter 17. Jesus said, uh, number 11, some of these I'm just, I'm putting together. So as you count them, don't go, that was 23 or, uh, I'm going to give you a lot of them, praise God. But Luke chapter 17, uh, here's another great sign Jesus said the earth would be like the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, you understand Sodom and Gomorrah was just two cities, but there were surrounding cities all around Sodom and Gomorrah. It was a whole area, and that whole area was infiltrated with sin. Uh, it was infiltrated with filth, homosexuality, and all sorts of uh, vile sin and vile things were taking place in Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns. Yeah. And in the days of Noah, it was quite the same. Homosexuality was running rampant. Uh, there was uh, all sorts of bestiality going on. Um, if you think about it, back in those days, uh, that's when there was a certain sect of angels that had left their, uh, their state and left their angelic state and came into the earth and had intercourse with women and actually birth beast or birth the Nephilim or birth these giants in the land. And so what was happening is these angels were creating these half human, half spirit demons. This is where demons come from. And so it was starting to blanket the whole world, starting to blanket the whole world. And the devil, what he was trying to do is he was stop, trying to stop the seed of a woman. And if he could get enough of this in the earth, he would stop Jesus from ever coming. So God, that's why the flood came, and that's why God destroyed all of those giants and all of those things, but the demons weren't destroyed. They left them, and that's what we deal with today. Angels don't inhabit bodies. They're demons. Demons are disembodied spirits, and they came from them. Amen. And so, and during, so during Noah's time, all this vileness and all this sexual stuff was going on, um, and all this wickedness was taking place, and God looked on it, and he said there was wickedness all over the earth. Yeah. Well, Jesus is, is comparing that to our day. He's saying, listen, right before I come, there's going to be the same kind of vileness. There's going to be the same kind of sexual sin. This, how many of y'all know there's nothing new under the sun? Yeah. You know, and so he's saying that all these things, this is what the earth is going to look like right before I come back. And you know as well as... as, as as me standing here, that just when you thought you heard the most grotesque thing, something outdoes it. And you think, how sick is humanity that someone could be that sick and that vile with, with demons? And so we see this as a sign of Jesus' return because Jesus points to this as a sign. Luke chapter 17 and verse number 26. And he says, as Jesus speaking, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat. Now this is important that we look at this. They did eat. They drank. They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, into the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. And notice here that Noah and his family were rescued before the flood came. 
that, that's significant because that tells us that right before God's wrath is poured out on this earth, we are rescued, we are raptured out of this place. Amen. 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 Then it says, likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. So commerce was going on. Just like I, I'm telling you, commerce is going to keep, there's going to be a shortage of things here and a shortage of things there, but commerce will continue. Are you with me? We're not going to be in a place where we all have to gather food and go in the hills and go hide out with our guns and beanie weenies. We need to stay engaged. Amen. You don't know what beanie weenies are. They may, I don't even know if they make them anymore. I used to like them. They're in a little can when I was a kid. Pastor friend of mine likes spam. I don't like spam. Pastor Chris Cody, he can have all that spam he wants. But I like the beanie weenies. So, amen. So, bring your mind back now. So, so he's not telling us that we need to gather all these things and go hide out in the hills. He's saying, listen, all these things are going to happen and commerce is going to keep going. Amen. But the same day, listen to this, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and, he, and, and destroyed them all. But remember when Sodom got out, when Sodom got, or excuse me, when Lot got out of Sodom, then everything took place. So there was, a, again, a rescue prior to the wrath. Even thus shall it be, now listen to this, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So he says, just like all this was going on, it'll be that way when the Son of Man is revealed. All these things are going to happen. How many of y'all would agree we're living there now? In my lifetime, this is the most vilest society I have ever seen. It's like Isaiah 60, it says, gross darkness will cover the people, and and brother and sister, it has. But how many of y'all know it also says, light shall rise up upon us. We should be in this last day, we should be getting brighter and brighter and brighter, more sold out to God, witnessing more than we ever have, winning more souls to Jesus, laying hands on the sick, doing the work of the ministry. All of us should be doing this. Casting out devils. Staying engaged. In that day, he, verse 31, in that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away, and he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, and the one, men, and the one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, The one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, and one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the angels be gathered together. That's the rapture. In the air where the the eagles are. That's where we're all going to gather. Are you with me? Yes, sir. So he is alluding to this, that all these different things are going to take place right before right before the rapture of the church. Now, it couldn't have happened in their day because it wasn't like the days of Lot and the days of Noah. But it is in our day. And all these other signs are in our day. Amen. Amen. So you and I need to do what? You and I need to live ready. We need to live free from all that trash. We need to make sure that we're cleaning up our lives and our families, cleaning up what we're watching on TV, cleaning up what we allow uh, ourselves to watch and what we allow ourselves to be involved with cleaning up our conversations, cleaning up our mindset, the way we think about things. What are we thinking on? What are we doing with our mind? How is our mind, you know, what are we doing with it? Are we, we, we renewing our mind by the Word of God? What do we think on? What do we wonder about? How, what do we fantasize about? You know, what's going on in our head? We need, to, we need to gather all those loose ends up, amen, of what, the way we think, and renew our mind and not allow thoughts to go and not allow different appetites to, to, to be loose in our life. Amen. Amen. We need to rein those things in. How many of y'all know that? Yes, and we need to live as holy. We're not perfect. We make mistakes and God's not expecting us to be perfect, but we're endeavoring to be. We're endeavoring to work out whatever we need to work out. We're working things out in our marriage. We're, 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 we're setting things right in our marriage and with one another and with our attitudes and what we're doing. We're in unity with one another. All these are different signs that I'm not even mentioning. But these are all important issues. You want to button down your family. You want to button down everything. You want to get things right in your life. 
You want to get things right in your marriage. You want to get things right in your children. Amen. You want to prepare like you're leaving. How many of y'all know, if you're, if you're on your way to Florida to go to Destin to go to the beach, how many of y'all know you don't go that same day? You prepare and prepare and prepare and you get your boogie boards and you get all your stuff ready to go. You're preparing, right? You don't just get up one day and we're going to go to Florida. No, there's a preparation. And if we really believe we're leaving, how many of y'all know we ought to be preparing? And our one attitude ought to be we ought to, we ought to want to take as many people as we can. We ought to want to win as many souls as we can. We ought to let God use us, use us at HEB. We ought to let God use us in our family. We ought to let God use us everywhere we go that we are tuned into Him. And Father, I am available. If you say something, I'm going to do it. I can witness to that person. I can lay hands on that person. I can cast the devil out of somebody. I'm doing the works of Jesus. That's what we ought to be doing. We have to stay engaged. We don't disengage from society. Like I said this morning, we don't point our finger at people that aren't living right. We're praying for them. We're doing all that we know to do to pray for them, to help them so that they don't miss this great event. And I believe that right now the harvest is white. I, I believe that there are people that are ready to hear the word of God. All you got to do is open your mouth and start witnessing, and your testimony is your witness. Has God done anything in your life? That becomes your testimony to somebody else that's hurting and somebody else that don't know. You think about that person that, you, that you're working beside and you know they don't know God and yet they don't even know you're a Christian. I mean, we got to come out of the closet. I'm not saying that you, you know, get in trouble on your job, but I'm saying we can be the light. We can be the light. Amen. And, and witness to people. Make that a goal of yours that I want to win at least one person to Jesus this year. One person to Jesus. Man, I tell you, if you win one person to Jesus, it was worth Jesus coming here. For one person. So we're living in this last of the last days, like the days of Noah, and we ought to live like we are on our way out. Amen. Number 12, let's go to Matthew chapter 24. You all right? Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. And we'll see a verse of scripture here. Matthew 24. Number 12 is many will not be ready at his coming. Many will not be ready. This is a sign. Many aren't ready today. And notice what Jesus said. Verse 44, he says, therefore, be ye also ready. Be ye also ready. He talks about, the, the, this is Matthew's account of Luke's of what I just read. About two will be at the mill and one, two will be grinding and one will be left and the other will stay and one will go and one will stay, etc. This is Matthew's account now right after that. He said, therefore, be ye also ready. You know what the word ready there means in the Greek? It means adjust your lifestyle. It means to prepare your life. Jesus is saying, if you know all these things are upon you, why don't you adjust your lifestyle? If you know all these things are upon you, coming on you now, won't you adjust yourself? Why are you going down the same road doing the same thing? Why are you still dealing with the same stuff? When will you adjust your attitude? When will you adjust your lifestyle? When will you adjust? That's what he's saying. Therefore, be ye ready. Therefore, adjust yourself. Amen. You know, I'm talking to the Lord all the time. Father, if there's anything in my life, I don't care any aspect of my life. I am an open book to you. If you see something that, that is not pleasing to you, if you see something I'm doing or not doing, I want you to tell me. I am open to you. I am open for this adjustment. Therefore, be ye also ready. Adjust yourself. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. So in other words, we can get to a point where we say, you know, well, we were all pumped up about it and Jesus didn't come. So he's not coming in this fall. So maybe he's going to come next fall. And we just start loosening our hold and going back to old lifestyles and going back to old things. There are certain things in my life I'll never go back to. 
I'm never going back there. I'm never going to live that way no more. I'm never going to be that way no more. I've turned the page on that. And every day we ought to be readying our life, readying our life to go. Still engaged in life, still living life, still getting married, still doing all the things we're supposed to do naturally, preparing like he's not coming back for 100 years, but being ready to go today. Amen. Amen. And he said, be ready, adjust yourself, adjust your lifestyle, adjust yourself. What is God speaking to you about? Amen. What is God talking to you about? Maybe he's not talking to your neighbor about that. Maybe he's talking to you. Maybe it's just an attitude. Maybe it's just, I don't know, whatever it is, but God is speaking to us. So many, he said, many won't be ready. Therefore, be ye also ready. Now look in Luke chapter 14, and we'll see this. And I'll go through this quickly because I've read this before, but it is one of the signs. Many will not be ready at his coming. You don't have to be that person. You don't have to be the mocker that says, where is this coming? Everything's always been the way it is. It's still the way it is. Jesus isn't coming. No, he's coming. And he said he's going to come when you think not. But if you're ready, you're going to go. But he don't find you doing things you shouldn't be doing. Going places you shouldn't be going. Hanging with people you shouldn't be hanging. That's not a threat. I just think there ought to be something on the inside of our our heart that Lord we want to be right with you again we're not perfect but we want to be right yes, sir. Luke chapter 14 Luke 14 16 it says then he said a certain man made a great supper and bed many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden come or invited for all things are now ready and this is really connected to Revelations 19 we're, we're sitting at the lamb uh, marriage supper of the lamb everything's already prepared and they all, with one consent, begin to make excuses. See, they weren't ready. They're making excuses why they can't come. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and tend to it. I pray thee have me excused. And the other said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I want to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I could not come. So all these are excuses. Right. And notice this, he didn't excuse them. There was no rebuttal on his side that said, you're excused. Okay, go ahead and go do what's more of a priority than me. Jesus is saying everything that I have, al everything is already in place. Everything is already done. Are you ready? Well, no, Lord, I got married. Well, no, Lord, I got to do this. Well, no, Lord, I got to do that. We're making excuses why we aren't ready. And he didn't say you're excused. So that, the, so that servant came and showed his Lord these things. In other words, he reported back to him. Then his master of the house, being angry, said unto his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and there is still room. You know why there's still room? Because there were many who weren't ready. They weren't ready. They were just giving excuses. And the Lord said unto the servant, oh, excuse me, verse 24, For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden or invited shall taste of my supper. In other words, Jesus is saying, listen, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the table's already set. Your name is already etched on the back of the seat. Everything's already, everything's already prepared on that side. The question is, are you? The question is, are we prepared? Are we still dealing with the same sin we've been dealing with for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years? Four months, six months. Are we ready? It's not a matter of God ready. Are we ready? Thank God for His grace. Thank God. Right now, we are living in that grace and that mercy right now. You're not living in the wrath of God. We're going to be out of here before the wrath of God. And believe me, you don't want to be here for the wrath. That's called a deceased of grace there'll be no grace then it's wrath it says the wrath of God is poured out not his grace grace is going to come to an end during that time and the wrath of God is going to be poured out on this earth of course there'll be Christians and God's going to spare them and God's going to help them while they are here I'm talking about those that are believing Christians that get born again 
But for the vast majority of people, it's going to be the wrath of God. Because Revelation chapter 6, it says, rocks fall on us and hide us from the one who's on the throne. Hide us from him. You won't be able to hide. This is the wrath of God. And he's saying everything's already prepared. Will you be prepared? Will I be prepared? I know it's pretty sobering, but it's the truth. And he says, and there went a great multitude of them and turned and said unto him, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister, yea, in his life also he cannot be my disciple. And of course, I told you that he's not talking about hating your mother and father. He's talking about loving them less. It means to love less. The Bible says hate is a sin of murder. So God's not telling us to hate someone. It's just love less. In other words, I love God more than I love my wife. So I'm not going to obey my wife over God. Are you with me? So this great sign, many, many people today are living more of a natural life than they are a spiritual life. And their life isn't in order. They aren't ready. Just like the ten virgins in Matthew, I don't have time to read it, but Matthew chapter 25, go back and read it. The ten virgins there, five of them were ready. Five of them had their lamps trimmed and they had oil. They were prepared. The other five were virgins too, and they didn't have their lamps trimmed, nor did they have any oil. And they said, give me your oil. Give me what you've prepared for. And they said, not so. We need this for ourselves. Because they could have prepared, but they didn't. It wasn't that they, it was an injustice because they couldn't have prepared. They chose not to. Just like you and I sitting here today, you can choose to prepare yourself, or you can choose to stay the same. You can choose to heed to this preacher tonight, or you can do exactly what you want to do. And God will let you do what you want to do. You can be ready, and if you're not ready, it's nobody's fault but your own. If I'm not ready, it's nobody's fault but my own because I had time. You have time right now to get ready. But that's going to come to an end, brother and sister. So we need to be engaged in our life every day, but man, we're ready to go. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about leaving. Amen. Amen. I'm excited about going. Praise the Lord. I'm thrilled. It's like I'm getting ready to go on a trip. And I'm excited about going on a trip. But at the same time, I'm still engaged here and I still got to do my job. And if you're sensing that, you can sense that other world's coming over here. I'm telling you, it's about ready to happen. And hopefully when it happens, we won't have nobody sitting here. Because we've prepared that we're not like the five virgins that could have prepared but didn't. We're not like these people that just give excuses. Well, I got my job. Well, I got my career. I got my 401k. I've got my investments. I've got my family. I've got my children. I've got my career. I've got my job. I've got my houses. I've got my stuff. I got all this stuff. I can't do that. I just can't seem to find time to do it. See, this is excuses. So this 12th uh, sign, number 12, is they're not going to be ready. Many people aren't going to be ready. And I didn't say they're going to hell. That's between them and God. But I think a lot of the people that are on the fence, once the rapture of the church takes place, they're going to be all in. They're going to realize they missed it. That this wasn't just a fairy tale. That this wasn't just a preacher with hot air preaching. That this event actually took place and it took place in my life. So many won't be ready. Jesus said that. 25, in Matthew 25, 10, or, 10 virgins, 5 are ready, 5 are not, which means half the church will be ready and half the church won't be. Number 13, there will be a great apostasy, a great departing from the truth. We'll briefly mention this because we've taught this in the past, but it's one of the signs that we're seeing right now. Remember, all these signs we're seeing. And he said, this is just the beginning of sorrows. Can you imagine this is just the beginning of sorrows? And then right after that, the, the rapture of the church takes place. And all of a sudden, the seven seals, God releases all seven seals. One of them at a time. One of them brings famine. One of them brings war. One of them brings all sorts of destruction on this planet. Amen. In one part, a third of the people die. And you think about the pressure and the persecution that's taken place on the earth then. 
What kind, of, what kind of tribulation is that? It says we're only going to see the beginning of sorrow. We won't be here for the birthing of all of it. Yeah. It's going to be bad. But it says here, one of the signs is a great apostasy, a great departure from the truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren. And, of course, Paul, after he wrote 1 Thessalonians, just a few months later, he wrote 2 Thessalonians. And he wrote this because the church had said that the rapture, they thought the rapture of the church already took place. And they were, they were all distraught, like, oh, my gosh, we were left. Now, think about this. If we were going through the tribulation, they wouldn't have been in distress. They'd have said, okay, well, this is part of the tribulation. So Paul had to teach that there was a pre-rapture, pre, pre-trib rapture. Because they're saying, we think the rapture of the church take, pl- took place. Which means Paul had to teach them that it came before the tribulation. Are you all with me? So the, he's writing back a few months, just a few months later, he's writing back, calming them down, saying, listen, the day of the Lord hasn't happened. Because if he would have been preaching that you're going to live through it, they never would have wrote that like that. I hope that makes sense. So it says here, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man, look at this, deceive you by any means. For that day, the day of the Lord, shall not come except there come a falling away. The word falling away is apostasio in the Greek. There's a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So he's saying that there's going to come what? A falling away. Are we seeing that today? Absolutely. We're seeing a falling away from the truth. Look at this in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressingly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I've seen this even in our own church where people just completely up in what they believe and walk away from it. So this is happening. There is a great apostasy taking place right now all over the planet. People are departing from the faith. They're departing from the word of faith message. They're departing from God. They're departing from biblical principles. They're departing from biblical morality. Amen. And when there's a departure from truth, when you look at the society today, you ought to look at society today and go, there's an apostasy. Because they all have departed from truth. We don't rate, not us, but the world don't raise their family in biblical principles no more. Why? There's an apostasy. There's a going away from truth. They do it the way they want to do it. Nobody's going to tell me how to live. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. We have a society that is anti-God. It is an anti-Christ society. Not, not the whole part. I mean, we still have Christians that are here, but I mean, by and large, you see it in the media. You see it on TV. You see it in the movies. You see it. Every part of society that's visible is, is really a rejection of God. It's a rejection of his word. It's a rejection of his principles. It is a disobedient, rebellious society. And when you don't raise your kids the way you're supposed to raise them according to the word, you're in rebellion against God. Amen. You're not doing it the way God wants you to do it. And it can be so subtle, too, that you take upon your way of doing things. How to get off on this family stuff, but it's good. You take upon your way of doing things because you think it's the right way and it's against the word of God. You are moving away from scripture. You're moving away from the character of God. My wife and I, when we raised our girls, we said, we're going to do it the way the word of God said. What the word of God said, that's what we're going to do. We're going to whip their behinds. We're not going to beat them. We're going to whip them with the rod. We're going to do what God tells us to do. We weren't perfect. But the word of God is the final authority. Well, what's happening in our world today? There's a great apostasy. There's a great leaving from from biblical truth. If you tried to say that, I know Brother Doug is a teacher back here. If he tried to say that in his school, they'd probably fire him. That you wanted to talk about biblical things and you wanted to do something scriptural. It's just everywhere. It's in every part of our society that somehow that you are weird, that you're strange, and they persecute you, and they you're an outcast. Amen. And that's part of the persecution that we talked about a little bit this morning that we're experiencing too. But there's a great apostasy of going away. Well, we don't need a pastor. We can do that at home. 
Well, Jesus didn't say that. There's so many things that we adopt, and not that people are bad. They adopt it, and they're realizing they're going against the truth. They're going against the principles. They're going against what the Word of God says. And sometimes we can be, praise the Lord, sometimes we can be in darkness and do it so long and not even realize it until somebody points it out to us. That there's a veil over our eyes that we don't even see that we're cursing. We don't even see that we don't get a hold of our mouth right. We don't see that drinking's not right. We don't see that going to rated R movies are wrong. We don't see that I can sit there and eat popcorn and, and watch some naked person on TV and, and, and watch, a, you know, trash. And we go pay money for all that. We don't see that. See, something is wrong. There is a departure from truth. Earlier, I had a lot of people going like this. I don't see that very much now. That's all right. I'm telling you the truth. You can love me or you can do whatever. You know, I'm just telling you the truth. You're not going to see me. I know some of y'all go to the movies and y'all looking around hoping nobody in members are here. You hurry up and run out of that movie and get in the hallway like, like you didn't come out of that movie. God's seen it. You carried the Holy Ghost in there with you. And I know people call me extreme. People call, the, people call that stance extreme. Yeah. They call that, stan, uh, that stance is out of touch. Come on. Pastor, you don't want us to have fun. Listen, when I was in the world, I'd done all the drinking and all the running around that I wanted to do. And when I got saved, I wanted to get rid of all that garbage. I'm not trying to see how much of the world I can carry with me to heaven. Because you can't carry none of it with you. I'm not interested in how much can I keep of the world, how much can I keep of God, and still have all of it. No, it's either one or the other, brother and sister. He's either Lord of all or Lord, and he's not Lord at all. And you're not going to see Jesus walking in that theater with you. Would he sit there and watch that? Would he watch that in the privacy of your home when nobody's there? The Holy Ghost is there. God sees all that. What's happening? There's a moving away from truth. There's a moving away from biblical standards. Uncleanness. Watching television programs that demean parents, that demean government, that demean authority. Just telling you the truth. This is all over the planet. Now, kids that are rebellious against God, they can't even hold jobs down when they get older. Come on. Can't take any correction. Out of control. Society that's out of control. What has happened? There's been a great apostasy. There's been a great going away from biblical truths. My kids, when I, they were in my home, I told them, I don't care if you're 15, 28, 52, or 100. If you're in my home, you're going to church every time the doors were open. You don't have a choice. This is my house. I love you, but we're going to do this thing right. Best we know. I didn't ask him, you feel like going to church today? All righty. That went over good. I'm just telling you. So, no, we're going to church. Get in the car. We get to go to church. Like Pastor Angie said, we... We get to pray. We, we get to do these things. It is an honor. It's an honor. So you see this in society now, a complete departure from the truth. And there's a thing now that they say, whatever your truth is, that's your truth. You can have your truth. That's truth. To, if I tried to tell them the word, they'd say, Brother James, they'd tell me, this is your truth, Pastor. That's your truth. But I have a truth, too. And my truth is just as good as your truth. See, that's what they say. They're trying to hold to a deception, and it's caused them to depart. Why? Well, you know, okay, praise the Lord. Number 14, artificial intelligence is another sign in the ability. I know artificial intelligence, not just robots, artificial intelligence all started with tracking human beings and the computer systems and everything that we have now. Now, this is a sign. 
we have ability right now to track every human being, track all your behaviors, track where you go. Now they even have a system set up that people don't even know about. They have a system set up for the Antichrist when he comes in that you can only have a certain amount of gasoline, a certain amount of food, and your car will shut off. So they're going to select how much gas you can use a week, how much food you can get a week. They're going to control everything. This is another sign because the intelligence is here. Most of you think you got control over things, but they watch everything that you do. Revelations chapter 13, look at this. Revelations chapter 13. Now I'm not saying you have to throw your cell phone away and... You know, act nutty. But I'm just telling you, I'm bringing this out to tell you of the intelligence that is out there and the capability that I only know a very minimal. Dr. Ash will probably know a whole lot more than me in that area. But the capability out there is there, is present. And far beyond anything I I probably would know. But we're going to look at this. Revelation 13 says in verse 16, and he shall cause all, bo- excuse me, and he, that's the Antichrist, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of man, and his number is 603 score, and 6 is where we get 666. So he's saying here that there's coming a time, and this is going to be in the middle of the tribulational period. You won't be here, hopefully. Yeah. There's going to be a time where, the, where every person will have to receive a mark in their hand or their forehead, or they can't buy or sell. Just recently, I was at the airport, our airport here. And I was going to buy a, a bottle of water, and I could not pay with cash. I either had to pay with a card, or I couldn't get no water. That's, that's what he's talking about. I don't have a mark in my forehead or hand, but what I'm saying is, is that technology is already here. That decision's already been made. We take cards only. We don't take cash. And some of y'all got them Apple watches. Doot. Y'all go to HEB, you don't even need a wallet no more. Are y'all with me tonight? I'll be done here in a minute. But the technology is already here. They know how much chicken you buy. They know how much hamburger you buy. They know where you go, how much gasoline you buy. They know everything about you. And this is one of the great signs, amen, of this antichrist system. And he said here you won't be able to buy or sell unless you have the mark. And if you get the mark, you're eternally damned. So anybody that comes through the tribulation and gets saved, what kind of time are you going to be in? Where you can't buy or sell, you'll be pillaging. But you can't buy or sell unless you have the mark. And if you don't have the mark, they're going to turn you in. Because you're not like them. Just like right now, all over the world today, all the craziness that's going on, all the positions that people are taking, the lifestyles that they have, they detest Christians. What do you think it's going to be like during this time? So this AI, this artificial intelligence is already here and working quite efficiently. Revelations chapter 11, look at this. And it says, chapter, verse, uh, Revelations eleven three. 3, and it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth, that's 1260 days, three and a half years. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God of the earth. These are the two witnesses that are preaching the word of God all over. And it says in verse 5, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in his this manner be killed. So they're, they're preaching the word unhindered. And if anybody tries to hinder them, fire shoots out of their mouth. So for three and a half, the first three and a half years of the tribulation, they are preaching the word unhindered. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of the prophecy. 
And they have power over waters to turn them to blood. Look what they can do. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, three and a half years, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their, bo and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindred and tongues and nations shall see their bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. Look at that. Someone's dead in the street. People would do that right now. And they're rejoicing over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of the life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. That's a rapture. They're getting raptured out. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Now I want you to see something that's very important as it relates to artificial intelligence. Go back to verse number 9. And it says, and they, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues, now they, remember, well, let me read verse 8, I'm sorry. And uh, in verse 8, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in, e of e in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindred and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days. How would they, everybody in the world, all nations see their bodies? Through the phones, through the internet, through artificial intelligence. No other time in history could that have taken place. So everybody is watching these people get killed on TV or on their phone or on a camera of some sort. This is where we are today. I'm going to go a little bit longer if that's okay. So in this situation here, you won't be able to buy, you won't be able to sell. All the, the point is, is the technology is in the earth. That's what I want you to see. That's a sign that the technology is in the earth. Number 15 and 16 is really one and of the same. It's in Daniel chapter, I won't turn there for lack of time. Daniel chapter 7, read it later, verse 25. And Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And it talks about Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, that the Antichrist will bring great stress and great mental pressure on people. That's a sign. He will seek to change the laws and the times. That's Daniel 7, 25. He will bring mental stress. Daniel 12, 1 talks about, and there will be great anguish like there never has been nor ever will be. These are signs. People are under great stress today. They're under great anxiety today. They're under great anguish today. They're being attacked mentally more than they ever have in their life. This is a sign. It's not just because, you know, um, we have a devil crazy. It, it is part of that, but it's a sign, too, of this mental pressure that's coming against people all over the planet. That's why you've got to take the time to renew your mind, to feed on the Word of God, and counter that with the Word. And not allow yourself. I'm under no mental stress, no mental anguish whatsoever. And I buried my daughter two months ago. But I give God all the glory and all the praise. I didn't say I didn't hurt. I didn't say that there weren't times in my day and that, that I have challenges. But I'm under no mental stress where I'm stressed out mentally and can't function. Amen. And I give God the glory for that. Because without him, I wouldn't be where I'm at. But it's his spirit living in me, and it's his love and his help and his support that's helping me and my family and all of us. We're a family. Move forward out of it. This is supernatural. We're getting on the other side of this. But in just in the natural, there's so much stress on people's lives. It's part of this, part of the signs. That's 15 and 16. Number 17, they're forming right now and have been for quite some time a one world government. Revelations chapter 13, look at this. Are y'all okay? Yeah. Revelations chapter, this ought to thrill you, not get you in fear. Amen. 
Unless you're not right, then you can just run to the altar. Revelation 13, and it says in verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, three and a half years. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And the power was given over to all, excuse me, and, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and, look at this, nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This is a one world government where it says right here, all nations will worship him. So there's coming a time when there will be a one world order. They've been talking about it for 20 years. And they're working behind the scenes to make this happen. They're working on a one world currency. And it's going to be an electronic currency. The dollar eventually will go away. It'll all be electronic. And they're working on it behind the scenes. And this is being formed as we speak. Amen. There are, there are meetings being held behind the scenes to achieve one world domination. How do we do this? Amen. And this was really, this one world government, this control was really demonstrated during COVID. That was a test. Can we mask them? How long can we mask them? I'm not saying that wearing a mask didn't help, so don't, don't, I'm not being negative on that. I'm just saying we were willing to do whatever they told us to do because of fear. The whole world was wearing them. And then if you weren't wearing them, everybody in the store let you know you weren't wearing them. So they all became uh, political police, if you will. We're going to report you. I remember one time we were standing out here and we'd have our mask on. Somebody was taking pictures and going to report us. And they didn't have no government official on the side of their car. They're conditioned people. And again, I'm not saying that it was wrong or right to wear it. I'm just simply saying when they started mandating what you can do, mandating where you can go, this is a type of control is all I'm saying. They're wondering how, uh, will, how you, will humanity respond. You can't get on a plane unless you do what I tell you. You can't go to another country unless you do what I tell you. You can't come to work unless you wear a mask. You can't go on a plane unless you get vaccinated. You can't go here unless you're doing this. See, my point is this is a big test too. And I know we have people in our church that died from it. So I'm not de belittling it. I'm not saying it's all the government. But what I am saying is behind the scenes, we don't want to believe a lot of things that are going on. Let me just say it. But there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes that we are not aware of. Well, you know why? Because the devil is crazy and he's raising up a system. That the Bible talks about all these scriptures I just read to you to control people. Well, hallelujah. Amen. And this is a whole thing to see the government want to know how you was going to respond. People calling the hotline, reporting people in. Well, my neighbor's not wearing a mask and they're in their house. You need to be wearing, I looked through your window, you weren't wearing a mask in your house. Some of them still wear them in the car. And there ain't nobody in there but them. I don't know how that's working. You're the only one in there. See, my point is, is it's fear, but it's also that control. And they knew if they just introduced one thing, how would people respond? People literally were fighting in the street over this. People were punching people, getting mad, doing all kind of crazy things because somebody took off their mask and liked to kill them, beat the, beat the tar out of them. So this one world government is, is taking place. And I don't have time to go in there. There are ten horns and all that that it talks about in the book of Revelations. But that all has to do with one world government. It's going to take place because it's in the word of God. Number 18 is Matthew chapter 24. You all right? I'm just about done. Hang on. Matthew 24. This will help us. 
Matthew 24. And I'm not trying to be controversial when I'm making this statement. So you don't have to say you don't agree with me. If you don't agree with me, that's okay. That's fine. I don't have a problem with it. We, we can disagree without being disagreeable. It says here in verse number 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end, that's important, then shall the end, the final conclusion, take place. That's an important word. He said this gospel will be preached in all the world. In the year 2000, uh, 70, I think it was 78% of all the world in the year 2000, and now we're at 2022, that's 22 years later. Uh, in that time of 2000, 78% of the world had been evangelized. So does the gospel have to be preached in all the world before the rapture? No. No. It says before the end. When the rapture takes place, is it the end? No. no. Now I'll prove that to you in, he, in Revelation 7. And if you come to me and go, no, I believe that, that's fine. Just believe what you want to believe. That's, I don't have a problem with it. I'm not mad at you. I love you. <laughs> so there's going to be, the sign is, an acceleration of people getting saved. And, and people are getting saved now. There are people, missionaries, still going over and all the world and preaching the gospel and that's going to continue how many y'all know it's more now because there's more people preaching now yeah. so there are people going there are people getting saved and going to continue to get saved but to, but to have to say this that everybody has to hear the gospel before the end comes I don't agree with that at what point do you stop people are having babies every day Are you with me? So what is he really referring back to? I want to show you something here. I believe, personally believe, that we're going to see a revival within the church of church people getting on fire with God. The church is filling up with Christian people on fire. For, I believe all that. But for the influx of souls, of people getting born again, will happen more after the rapture than before the rapture. The gospel will continually, and I'm going to prove it to you in Scripture. Yes, sir. The gospel will continually be preached in the tribulational period. And there will be m tens of millions get saved. Amen. When you wake up one day, well, you won't because you're going to be in the clouds. Amen. Somebody's going to wake up one day, and they're going to find their baby gone. Somebody's gone in their house, and they're going to turn on the TV, and it's going to be pandemonium all over the world. Yes. Then we have to track you. That system's already in place. We'll have to register you. Because we got to know who's here and who's not here. That system's already here. So in Revelation 7, let's look at this real quick, and then we'll, we'll, I'm going to hurry on here. We'll be done in a minute. Revelation 7, 4, and it says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed. This, was in the, this is in the middle of the tribulation where Christians are being martyred and being killed. Their heads are being cut off because of their, they will not receive the mark. They're born again, and the Antichrist is killing them all. And I heard a number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, this is 144,000, and it tells you all the tribes are from that's going to go and evangelize the world with the two witnesses. Then drop down to verse 9. After this, I beheld and lo, a great, look at this, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and psalms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. So we have the 144,000, we have the two witnesses, and they're witnessing the people all over the world, multitude that no man could number is getting born again, and they are all being slain. How do we know that? Keep reading. 
And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, he, he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So during this tribulational period, you're going to see tens, we're going to see tens of millions of people getting born again right in the midst of the tribulation, more than we've ever seen in the history of man. And all of them are killed, and they're around the throne, and they're saying, he's saying, sir, where, where'd they come out of? We already had a rapture. The church is already here. Where'd these people come from? He said, these are they that came out of the great tribulation, those that gave their lives because they wouldn't take the mark. So do you see that? Yes, the gospel is going to continually be preached in all the world, but that does not have to happen before the rapture of the church takes place because we see it in the tribulation that it keeps going. Does that make sense? Because then if we said, okay, then, then the, the gospel is going to be preached, okay, well, how would you even know that? And then when it's done, then what about the tribulation? Because it's still being preached. So during this time, this, there's going to be worldwide evangelism for 42 months. Yes, sir. People are going to be saved by the drove. Churches are going to fill up like they've never filled up before. Yeah, and there's going to be power and there's going to be all. The Holy Ghost is still here working with humanity. You and I are in heaven. Yeah. But then all of a sudden the Antichrist, he begins to rise up. And he begins to, with his following, with the one world government, and he begins to destroy the Christians. He begins to tell them he does false miracles. The spirit of the devil is in him. He does miracles and wonders and signs, and they think he's God. Uh -huh. He declares himself as God. He sits in the, in the, in the, in the throne there and, and desolates it. Amen. Yeah. And he does miracles and all these different things, and they think he's God, and they, they go hook, line, and sinker after him. Uh -huh. And then the ones that don't, he's going to say, you don't need the Bible no more. I'm here. And all these Christians, we need to get rid of them because they are anti what we're doing. Uh -huh. Well, there's already been a, 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 a people that have been raised up that are anti-God. Yeah. Are y'all with me? Yes, I know I went a little bit long. but So we're going to see tens of millions and millions of people getting saved. Praise God. But you don't want to be here for that. No. Number 19 is in Luke chapter 21. Jesus said there'll be signs in the moon, the stars, in the skies. We're seeing more of the blood red moons and all these different things that you're seeing now more than you ever have. These are all signs. Jesus said in Luke 21, uh, 21, 25, and it says, And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, Men's hearts failing them for fear. There's another sign I'm not even bringing out. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. So we're seeing that in the stars. We're seeing that in the moon. We're seeing that... In the, in the heavenlies, which is the, 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 uh, the second heaven. The first heaven is the atmospheric heaven. The second heaven is the stellar heaven. And then the third heaven is the heaven where, it's where Jesus lives. That's, his, that's the planet. So we're seeing all kind of stars, and they're finding planets now that, out there that, that could sustain life. I mean, there's all kinds of things taking place out there that they're seeing. And these are all signs yes, that knowledge would greatly, would greatly enlarge, and they're starting to see things they've never seen. So all these signs, all these 19, and there's more. And the last one here is in Luke chapter 18. My wife and I talked a little bit about this today. Luke chapter 18, one of the signs that Jesus comes back, he said there will be a lack of faith or standing on God's word. Yes, sir. Remember that? He said in Luke chapter 18, and let me just read it real quick. Luke chapter 18, he said, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth. So one of the great signs, too, is this not only this apostasy, but Jesus is saying, hey, when I come back, will I find people trusting me? 
Will I find people ready that are ready to go? Will I find people? Well, he's going to find people. We're ready. But how many won't be? If this was going to be a worldwide thing and it was no big deal, Jesus wouldn't even have brought it up. He would have said, when I come back, I'll find faith everywhere. But he's saying, when I come back, will I find any? As it relates to eight, they say there's eight billion people. I don't know if that's accurate, but seven to eight billion, I know that's accurate. Seven to eight billion people on the planet today. And how many of those seven to eight billion people are in faith and are believing and trusting in God every day? They're trusting in the government. They're trusting in what they can do. They're trusting in their own hand, not trusting in God. So all these signs we're seeing right now on the earth, and there's no other generation that has seen these signs. And like Jesus said, when you start to see all these things happening all at one time, are we seeing all these things happening at one time? Is all these things happening right now? What did he tell us in Luke 21? Look up, because your redemption draweth nigh. Hallelujah. Well, the word is good. Thank you, Father. Let's all stand up tonight. Father, we're grateful tonight for your word. We're thankful for you teaching us. <coughs> Father, we're going to be ready. We're determined to be ready. And I know I've given this altar call many times. But if you're here tonight and the Lord's dealt with you about anything in your life that you need to get right before him. And you're not right with God. And you know you're not right with God. You can get right with God right now. All you got to do is come up here in Jesus' name. And let me lead you through a prayer of repentance and getting your life right with God. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. He won't knock the door down of your heart. Like Pastor Angie said this morning, you have to be willing out of the heart. God's not, Jesus is not wanting to control you. He loves you. He loves you. But it's got to be a heart connection. Anybody need to make that decision tonight? Praise the Lord. Just want to make sure. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You know, we don't discourage any of the children. Never discourage any of the children. Sometimes we go, well, they're fine. Yeah, they are. But you know what? You, don't, you, you, you let them follow their heart. Let them follow their heart. Because that's important. Because if you let them follow their heart at this age, when they get your age, it'll be a lot easier. You know, because if a child senses something, you know, Jesus, when he was 12 years old, his mother was kind of distraught about it. And she said, where are you? And they didn't even notice that they were with him. And he come back, he said, didn't you know I was about my father's business? He was in the house of God at 12. And most people say, well, they don't know what they do. Well, if, if something is prompting them to come, it's the Holy Ghost. You may say, yeah, but I'm a great parent. I didn't say you weren't. I'm just telling you, sometimes children just want to respond. And we encourage that. Right? We encourage that. Praise the Lord. Anybody else need to come? Praise God. I think this is great. I think this is great. Now, all you children that are up here, Jesus, thank Jesus loves you. And you're just a bigger child. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I'm just, I just want to pray this prayer. And you all pray this prayer with me, okay? We're going to pray just a prayer of dedication. But here's what I want to tell you. Okay, listen, real careful. Anytime you mess up, we all mess up. But whenever you mess up, all you have to do is say, Father, please forgive me. And you know what? He forgives you, and you never have to be back up here. Does that make sense? So just because you mess up, don't mean you got to come back up every time. That make, and I'm not saying you're doing that. I am, I, I, I'm glad you're here. Does that make sense? But if you do mess up, you don't have to wait till church comes and pastor gives an altar call. Right? You can just say, Father, forgive me. And he forgives you. Amen? So I want you all to pray this prayer with me. I want you to say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And Father God, I give my life to you. Wholeheartedly to you. And I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, for being my Savior. And I ask you to forgive me of 
of anything I've done wrong. I dedicate myself to you. I love you, Jesus. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. And I thank you for it. I believe that Jesus died for me on the cross. And I believe that he rose from the grave. And I accept Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me and loving me and helping me. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, bless these children. Bless these children in the name of Jesus. Be blessed, honey. Be blessed. I just think it's amazing how these kids came up. Be blessed, honey. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. A good receiver. Be blessed in the name of Jesus. I just think that's awesome to have children to have a tender heart towards God. I think it's awesome. Praise the Lord. And if you're their parent, just say, hey, and you didn't teach them that. Hey, if you mess up, sweetheart, we all do. Just say, Lord, I just repent right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Teach them that. Because we all mess up. Amen. Big kids or little kids. You have something? Oh, okay. Praise the Lord. Looked like he did. Praise the Lord. Well, did you get some help out of these 20 signs? We got 62 more signs. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. He say, my God, Pastor 20 is enough. Well, you know, I'm just trying to help. I love you. Father, we bless your people tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the angels of God. Carry us safe to our destination. I call your people blessed. And, Father, we are committed to you. And, Father, we're committed that if there are things in our life that, that are not pleasing to you or of adjustments we need to make, we'll willingly adjust our life to you. We love you and bless you. I call this church blessed. And I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this church. In the mighty name of Jesus. Before you leave, how many of y'all are more excited since we've been talking about this? How many of y'all just sense there's something getting ready to happen? Amen. Well, go tell somebody about it. Amen. And, uh, and, and we'll see you on Wednesday night. Be blessed. We love you. Angels of God go with you. Turn to two or three people. Give them a great big God bless you. And you are dismissed.